Uh, let me show you my screen. How do we go again to slideshow? Sometimes I have to literally look for the slideshow. Okay. So for the past three weeks, I've been teaching on God's plan and the process of God's plan. And we've been learning from a couple of Bible characters on God's plan and his, his purpose. So um, just to give a recap from the beginning, we learned about how God alone has the plans that he, I mean, he alone knows the plans that he has for us. And these are plans to prosper us. And usually the Lord gives us a plan, but he doesn't give us the process on how that plan is going to be achieved. But the process is what prepares you to attain the plan that he has for you. And so coming to the prodigal son, we're going to learn from today from the prodigal son when he was going through his process and what are some of the things that we can learn from him. And so we begin reading from Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. Let me see. Yeah, I have it here. Let me go ahead and read that. <clears throat> so Luke 15 says that there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set up for a distant country and they squandered his world in wild living. In another version, it talks about reckless living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and I am here starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best rock and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has been back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me any, even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home to kill the fattened cow for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. So there are two main verses here that I want us to focus on, verse 32 and verse 31 and, and verse 11. 
So we all know the parable of, uh, of Jesus. We all, we all know about this parable. And the first thing that we want to know about parables is that parables are early stories with heavenly meanings. So it's a story that Jesus was telling, but it had a heavenly meaning. And uh, we don't, it's, been, it's a very common story that we talk about how this young, young man asked for a share of his property from his father while his father was still alive. And normally we know that I know in the African culture and in so many cultures, it is really um, obscene for you to ask for your property, your own inheritance while your dad is alive and he's not dead. You're asking for your property. And so he takes his own share of his own wealth and he just quanders it. And as a result, he faces severe hardship and becomes very, very destitute. And so, this hardship is considered like the way of life that he had chosen, the things that he picked to do, the fact that he went out, it's, it's not just the fact that the parents could not reach out to him, but the life that he had chosen is considered dead. So that's what the Bible talks about, dead in sin. And verse 32 says that we had to celebrate him and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. His way of life is considered dead. He was alive, he was living, but he was dead in sin until when he realizes himself. And so there are three ways of learning and learning in life. We have, sometimes we learn, we learn from training and advice. When you're still growing, you're being groomed by your parents, you're being trained, you're being advised, you will have all of this advice. But sometimes if you don't take the advice, you can see other people's lifestyles or you can learn from other people's mistakes. And that sometimes comes as a warning for us not to take the same route, which therefore means that, oh, if somebody made an error in certain things, I tell you that, look, I made this error. Please do not go the same way because if you take this route, it's going to be a longer way for you to make it. So if you want to make it, do not take this route. You are smart enough, you can easily copy that. But if you do not listen, so you haven't learned from the advice or from the, the training that you've been having and people have been helping you, there's another way to learn. And the only way that you have to learn is out of experience. And that is out of your own experience. This is usually the most painful and the most effective because we, we get to taste what it is called pain. Because there, you don't need your mom or dad, auntie, brother, sister is not going to give you any advice. You have to only endure what it takes. And this is where the prodigal son finds himself. Because even though the Bible doesn't tell us that the father um, scolded him or anybody advised him, but he is in a place to have learned from his other brother to stay back. But he became... Maybe he, he, he lacked patience, and this happens. There are so many prodigal sons. So the story of the prodigal son is one of the, those stories that teach us how it feels to learn from our own life lessons and errors. And so from what happened to him, he will live to tell the story of his life. He will live to tell his children how he was, I don't know if the right word is frivolous, how he was, he squandered his dad's money, but he would leave to tell the story of his life. Amen. Now, from, for, for this prodigal son, there is a process of entitlement that he had. And this can be found in verse 11 when verse 11 to 14, I will say so. So where here we see the younger son said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So he felt, he felt entitled. And 
what is the sense of entitlement that he had? Firstly, we need to understand what the sense of entitlement is. The, the sense of entitlement refers to an individual's belief that they inherently deserve special treatment, they deserve privileges, they deserve advantages without necessarily having earned or worked for them. And we find a prodigal son, he feels like he's entitled to his father's inheritance. That is what his father has worked for. And from the way he squandered it, he doesn't understand the pain of, of uh, having an investment. He just got, since something, you just had it, your father is alive, and he just spent the money and enjoy my life while I have the time to. But the days came by so fast because money is like peanuts. You, the moment you start spending it now, He's going to get finished in less than no time. And so the sense of entitlement is also a psychological attitude or mindset that often stems from feelings of superiority, self-importance, or belief that one's needs and desires should be prioritized above others. So this happens in, in we live a life, especially here in America, it's very common where children feel so entitled. And that is one thing that brings a lot of problem because when you feel so intact, you feel so important. You want people to do things for you in a certain way and always attend to your needs first. It's always an issue. And um, like I said before, this is also according to the Jewish culture, asking for your inheritance while your parent is still alive is disrespectful. In African culture, even here, you see that I haven't seen a culture where People would want to have their inheritance while the dads or parents are still alive. We always inherit those things when the parents are not there. And I strongly believe that what happened to the prodigal son, God wants us to learn a bigger lesson when it comes to this issue of taking inheritance. It just shows the father what would have happened to the son if he was dead. You think that if the dad wasn't still alive, after, if the dad was dead, he took his own share and went out, then came back empty-handed Will his brother listen to him. He will work like that servant. He would, he would gnash his teeth. He would, he would have to literally work for himself. And this happens in so many families where maybe the dad, will no longer be there and children get the money and they just disappear and they squander the whole thing because they don't understand how this was acquired. And here we see that the father was not angry that his son asked for a share of the inheritance while he was still living. This one is a typical example of what happens when children acquire wealth and they do not know how this wealth came about. They easily squander it easily, especially when their parents are gone. And so this is the, the story of the prodigal son teaches us the importance of forgiveness, compassion, and all of that. But what, I, what is the impact of entitlement? That is the, the main thing I want us to look at, is how entitled he was. And so the sense of entitlement can be observed in various aspects of life, such as in your personal relationship, the workplace, society at large and it is essential for us to recognize and address this attitude because it can negatively impact relationships create conflict and hinder personal growth and development especially when <clears throat> you just feel like you're entitled and so sometimes it's also very important for us to distinguish between entitlement and an unhealthy sense of entitlement it's right for you to be entitled, you're entitled to having your food, your personal needs, even in your personal relationship. But when it becomes unhealthy, that's where there is a problem. So, for example, we have entitlement to basic human needs. Respect and fair treatment is reasonable and essential for all individuals. But however, an unhealthy entitlement can lead to an inflated ego, one, a lack of empathy and a disregard for the rights and needs of others when you always feel like no. It's always about me first. So if I need this, everybody has to, everybody's world has to stop for me to acquire what I want. So whether you are breathing or you are living, I want this, give it to me now, 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 now. That sense of entitlement is not good at all. That's very negative. And so 
The prodigal son does not explicitly, it doesn't really mention the sense of attachment in the son's character, but we can interpret certain aspects of his behavior as indicative of entitlement like his attitude. And let's look at some elements. For example, demanding his inheritance prematurely. That's a sign of disrespect. It is dishonorable because it essentially implied that the son couldn't wait for his father to pass away naturally to receive his inheritance. And he wanted what was rightfully his, but without showing patience or acknowledging his father's authority. And also you would notice that some people out of respect for their dad or their parents, they believe in building of legacy. God, for me, I've always seen God as a father who builds legacy. And this happens in various aspects of our lives. The way I look at the legacy that God builds, one of the most impactful part of it is when you are a beneficiary of anything that God has given you. For example, if you have always been a child where people treat you well, Build it as a legacy. Build an altar of that and learn to treat people well too. That's a legacy. Continue doing that and it will continue from, from generation to generation. I actually visited an orphanage in Cameroon. And this orphanage, I learned one lesson. There was a child that was um, adopted by a certain family. And that family raised him to the level where he went to school and went to Germany, became a medical doctor. He came back and opened a bigger orphanage in, in Bermuda. There, he kind of, he has children living in that orphanage, but he also has children that are living with other families. So if a family member can keep you, it's much more better so you get to have a family life and learn what it takes to have a father and a mother and stuff. But he had more than 700 children the time I went there. And his, his intention was that he lived a life where he benefited from a family that was not his. So he cannot feel entitled and just grow and do whatever he wants, but he wants to help other children. And so he helped so many children and at that orphanage. He had a farm, he had animals, he had a laboratory where he teaches those children um, science. Um, they were making perfumes. They made their own products. Everything they consumed in there, they made it. They, the farms, they worked from there. And we had people could always come there to teach them, to wash their clothes. It was a, it's a complete Christian environment. And he has um, like a place where people can come there for retreat. That's how he generates income to feed those children, but they make perfumes, they do other stuff and they even have a library. So you could see that from one person, you have many children that have been helped. So um, the way the father functions, he's not, an, it's not the dead end of a road, it's the beginning of something. And also sometimes when you're not treated right, look at the other side of it and say, okay, if I wasn't treated right, I expect to be treated this way. So instead of feeling like, oh, I was treated wrongly. My parents did not do this, so you cannot do that for others. Change, open another route, teach people how they're supposed to be treated and be nice and continue building a legacy out of that. So it's not about, let me just acquire this wealth and let me eat it, let me spend. And that's not what happened to the political son. He wanted his inheritance prematurely and what was the repercussion? And God was bringing him somewhere there's something the Lord was teaching him and he's teaching us as well. In as much as we have this, the, the, the main idea of God's forgiveness, his kindness, he did not question him. He, he, he just welcomed him back. He received him. But he is, there's a lesson that he has learned. And trust me, after he comes back, he's going to put himself together. Secondly, he will not feel entitled like, oh, I have my own inheritance. He will be reminded, and nobody needs to remind him that you spent your own wealth already, but you need to work for your own wealth right now. You need to put yourself together. You need to know, and out there, he has learned that money is not easy to come by because he tried to work. He thought he could make it, but out of his struggles, he couldn't make it. So he had to come back as a servant. And 
in as much as we are children of God, but we are servants to the Lord as well. We're working, we work us in the vineyard. We have all the wealth, we have everything. But until when you lose that opportunity that you have with the Father, then you understand the bitter side of life because you, you it looks like you've been thrown in the wild wind. Because while we are under his covering, you have everything that the Lord has given to you, all his rich blessings. Secondly, we have his reckless living. After receiving his inheritance, what did he do? He went, squandered everything on extravagant, wasteful living. So this is another behavior that suggests a sense of entitlement to a life of luxury and pleasure without considering the consequences of his actions or the effort his father put into building their wealth. So when we just grow up, especially when children are living at home, the parents are taking care of the abuse and everything. We just use the life, we flush us the way we want, do whatever we want, eat and throw the rest and do that. But when you start living on your own, you would see what the children become. Now, if you turn on the light bulb in their room, they, <laughs> in one of the rooms, they'd be like, switch it off, switch it off, because they're calculating what is going to happen at the end of the month. But when they were living in the dad's house, what happened? You just use whatever you don't, you feel like that you can, because you don't understand the pain of acquiring money or maintaining a healthy life that your parents were giving to you. Until when we have grown and become parents ourselves, we start seeing how life has always been. So ultimately the prodigal son story serves as a lesson in humility, redemption, transformative power of uh, forgiveness. And it also illustrates that even those who have acted with a sense of entitlement can experience a change of heart and be embraced with love and compassion when they choose to turn back to a path of righteousness. And um, like this story tells us about God's compassion and forgiveness. The Lord's hands are always open and ready to receive us and welcome us. But then the Lord says in... Um, in Jeremiah, let me go to Jeremiah 29, verse, it should be verse 13. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. Okay. Then um, verse 12 says that, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Because he's right there. And he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. So the Lord is always there. He's always watching. But he wants to see that total change. So this prodigal son, he has always had it all. He enjoyed everything. He has enjoyed the beauty of life. He did everything he could do. and. When he started working, he couldn't even afford to eat. So much so that pigs had sufficient food than him, a living human being. He was working, but he could not afford basic his basic need, which was just regular food. And so there he learned a lesson. And he was like, it's not always rosy. I will not always have it like I want it or how I get it. And that's what happens when children feel so entitled that they think they can skip in and out and do whatever when they test it out there. And if they happen to have a sense of repentance and come back, they become transformed. And that transformation comes in with a life lesson where they can now apply it and be put together. Our prayer is let them come quickly to their senses while it is still early. Because you can come to your senses at maybe 50, 60, and there you, the rest of your life, you live in regret and like, what did I do to myself? So um, when it comes to grace, sometimes this in for this entire week, for some reason, I've just been listening and hearing teachings about grace, but the sense of entitlement that comes in 
when it comes to grace. And so we do not want to abuse that grace, just like the prodigal son. He had it all. He had everything he needed. He had the grace and everything. So he got the, everything and went and squandered it. And so grace and entitlement is something that we Christians, we don't want to feel entitled over in, in as much as we have unmerited favor of God. And that's what Paul is saying in Romans 6 verse 1, that what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? No, and he continues with verse 3, he says, God forbid. So we have unmerited favor, but we don't want to abuse it. So when it comes to aspect of grace, sometimes Christians struggle with feelings of entitlement due to various reasons. One, we feel like, okay, this is unmerited favor, unconditional love that God extends to humanity, right? Forgiveness, we have salvation. And despite our shortcomings and our sins, just like the prodigal son, he had it all. However, certain attitude or misunderstanding can lead some Christians to feel entitled in the context of grace. This can be manifested in so many ways, one of which is assuming salvation. So sometimes we just develop a sense of entitlement towards God's grace by assuming that we are automatically saved and accepted by God solely because of our Christian identity or affiliation. You have so many people who just talk about Christ, but they're not really saved. And so this perspective can lead to compliancy and lack of personal responsibility in living a life of faith and righteousness. It's not like you want to be living a life of fear, saying, oh, I'm afraid that I will not make it to heaven. And this, no, it's just the way God has made life, he has made it simple and it is very beautiful. And I came to realize that in whatever thing we do, we should do it as unto Christ. If you're serving food to somebody, do it as unto Christ. If you have a guest, even if you don't have food, offer water. Just do it as unto Christ. Just be nice. It doesn't hurt to give somebody a smile. Someone can even visit. You don't have food, but the welcome that you have, they feel warm. So we don't want to take everything for granted because we have grace. Say, so, oh, I'm being saved. I'm giving my life to Christ. So I'm giving my life to Christ. I can do whatever I want to do. In the church, you have people who are extremely rude. Even though they're in the house of God. I listened to a preacher who said he was getting married to a white woman and because they felt like it wasn't right, he received the highest persecution from church. And you will be so shocked that this is a child of God in the house of God where you will have extreme love and warmth and welcome. That's where you receive the persecution. And these are all people that are saved. And so this Teaching Paul is talking about grace. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to us believers, children of God, born again believers, that we shouldn't abuse grace. And I'm relating it to the prodigal son where he had his own um, fair share and gratefully he quickly realized himself. And now he will not abuse grace anymore. He's going to know what it means to spend a dime. He knows that even what he has experienced, even though he spent everything, his brother hasn't experienced that side of life. His brother doesn't yet get what he has gone through. He's squandered everything he has seen it, but he knows what it takes to have a nickel. It's not something that you just spend because you've seen it. Now, he has presumption on forgiveness. Some Christians are might presume God's forgiveness, assuming that they can repeatedly engage in sinful behavior without genuine repentance or change. And this attitude will trivialize the significance of God's grace and, uh, and overlooks the transformative power of genuine repentance. This is how the other brother of the prodigal son fell when his little brother came back. He's like, no, this son of yours, he just spent everything that you gave him in less than no time and the next thing he comes here there's a party for him no he just he can't just have grace like that i've been here i've never had any opportunity to celebrate with my friends i've been working every day he was actually just coming from the field tired so when he heard that he got angry it's like no i can't even go in there but there's a different perspective that god looks at things especially when it is genuine because he knows that he has learned a lesson. Now that he was dead, we don't want to lose him again. And the Bible talks about 
uh, when one sinner repents, heaven celebrates. And that's exactly what is happening there. The whole family was celebrating because he would leave the 99 and go after the one was a sinner. And he's there watching and waiting. But do we just abuse grace that, okay, um, I think the last time, let me just, you know, have fun today and go back to God, his merciful father. No, we don't have to do that. And another thing we have, another aspect we can see where grace manifests itself in prosperity, gospel mindset, which is what is very common these days, where we have some Christians may adopt prosperity, gospel mindset, believing that God's grace guarantees material prosperity and success. And so it, it, it has been a niche to get people come closer, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't actually give material possession. He does that, but what's your intention? So, and so sometimes you find yourself with those people that talk about the sense of entitlement. This is what the Lord says. This is this. So we feel entitled to worldly blessings, which is inconsistent with the true essence of God's grace. God's grace doesn't just tell you that, oh, as a believer, you just have everything that you want. No, it doesn't work like that. He said, I will supply your needs according to my riches in glory. He will supply your needs. And one of those things you would see like Abraham, he was really, really old when he had his only son. It took him so long, but he was a child of God. And all these years, he, he was serving God. And you will see even in that family line, you see a lot of the women suffering from barrenness. And you'll be like, this was the friend of God. So it would have been easy for them to just have those children as much as they wanted. But God always has his own ways and his ways are not our ways. So it is important for us to have a true understanding of God's grace. And this should be demonstrated in compassion, empathy, and willingness to extend grace and forgiveness to others, just as we have received from God. And also cultivating a deeper understanding of grace, reflecting on our personal attitudes, very important. And aligning with teaching of Christ can help us to avoid feelings of entitlement and embrace a more humble, loving, and grace-filled approach towards others and their relationship with God. Amen. I think that was the last slide. Do we have any questions or contributions? Amen. Good morning, sis. Good morning, Jero for Jesus. Welcome, Mama. Thank you. Thank you so much for the word. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Rev. Morning, Sister Vera. Um, no, thank you for the teaching, sis. Yeah. It, it's, it's one of those that helps you um, uh, it kills pride. Because yeah. I think entitlement also is rooted in pride. Um, so when we are walking around mindful that we are actually not entitled to anything, everything is by grace, it keeps us humble. It keeps us humble. So thank you for that, sis. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. So uh, what? What what uh, um, down to me when you were talking, and I know you you insist on entitlement that um, the father has the same love. The father has the same love for his son that stay home, and for his son that left, and his love never changed actually, because the one when he came back, he just ran to embrace him without asking him uh, what he did with the money or quarreling with him. Uh, it's just my little film that is playing in my head now I'm displaying. So he has the same love. He left, his love never changed. And I think that his love, um, 
was also because the son came back, although he left, he came back. The fact that he came back, he found the same love as mm -hmm. the one who stayed. It just down in my mind like that, that the father has the same love. So the love of God is unchangeable. Even for the one who left, they just need to come back. So it's, it's, it's what came to me. But uh, um, I love, and I will watch it again. Because, you know, what is funny is when you have your watches, when I'm receiving a download of mine too, and I'm typing at the same time, so my brain is splitting too. But I will have to go back and, and listen so Amen. I can get everything you say. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Praise to God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes, um, that is a very, very good um, point right there. Because, you know, sometimes we feel like, oh, because you've fallen short of the glory, the Lord doesn't love you anymore. His love is genuine. It's constant. His love never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we are the ones with the flesh. And so because we easily judge from our own ways, we think that, no, God doesn't know. His love is always there. And he just wants us to come back to him genuinely. Amen. Amen. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Women of God, thank you so much this morning. It's a powerful teaching. Um, it, this is a teaching that has so many facets. This prodigal son parable has so many facets, and I like the way you you um, brought it up again this morning. Uh, the sense of entitlement, and um, like Minister Ruth said, that it keeps us humble. Um, the humility that God requires of us every day. To work, to work on every day is, is a foundation of what it's how we stay with the right perspective. It's how we stay with the right, um, how can I say it, uh, appreciation of everything that goes on around us. Because humility will allow us to see something and reflects a mirror, reflects it as a mirror. One of the teachings that profoundly touched me that I got is one of the rabbinic teaching that is saying that we should see um, each other as a mirror. And it, by seeing each other as a mirror, it will keep us humble. Because a sense of entitlement um, is is a um, how can I put it? It's a, it's it's a total uh, not total. It's a manifestation of our pride, indeed. Because when we stand and think, "Oh, I ought to receive this. I ought to receive that. I ought to receive this." Um, but we don't see what the other person is supposed to receive. He, put, he puts us in a place of pride. It's all, everything about me, 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 me. You see? So imagine that, and a lot of teaching also in prodigal son is saying, oh, the older brother is jealous, the older brother is, is wicked, the older brother, all of the teachings on the pulpit that is bashing the older brother, like to pause, let us pause and, and see the perspective of the older brother. Because like Repi said, the father loves everybody. Now, if we take, we, we stand on that truth. The father loves the older brother and the younger brother. He has to understand the perspective of the older brother. The older brother for fear and love for his father tried every day to do the right thing. 
But the younger brother has rebellious ways, takes the money, goes and spend. It's a reduction of the wealth of a family. It's a reduction of the resources of the family. The father is still alive, he's taking, he's taking his inheritance. That's not considered inheritance. It's considered the wealth of the family at that time. So if the family was worth um, $100,000 and upon the death of the father, the younger one was supposed to receive 50,000. If he takes the whole 50,000 he goes when the father is alive, the family is no longer the hundred thousand dollar rich, the family's wealth has been reduced. So the younger brother is true receiving forgiveness, receiving all of that, but he's depleting the resources of the, of the family. The father is showing that we have to forgive. Unconditional love forgives but we have to also see the perspective of the older brother that when we are in a family, um, the example of the church you even mentioned was, was profound because sometimes we suffer brutally more in the church than when with people that are in the world. There is jealousy, envy, backbiting, gossiping, all of that in the church mistreatment, all of that in the church, flat out wickedness, witchcraft, all of that in the church. People taking the Bible verses to pray against each other, all of that in the church, it's no different than the words even worse. Someone coming into the church to find refuge has entered a battlefield. How is faith is going to grow? How is faith is going to be strengthened? So it, this parable, like I say, is full pack of lessons. So I want to thank you for that. I'm going to stay stop here today. I mean, right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this was a very good uh, perspective that you, you came out with, especially looking at the, the older brother as well, because most times we want to think that like, oh, he was just terrible. And um, also, it's also another sense of entitlement because we feel like, oh, you just have to forgive. You just have to forgive and have compassion and don't think about it. And one of the things that we forget is the person who is forgiving you, you, you it's, it's having a wound in there because you keep punching on the heart and you just want to look at the pain and walk away and say, it's okay. So... It's not okay. We have to, when it's not okay, we have to accept that it's not okay. And how do we handle it going forward? Amen. So is there any amen? Is there any other question or prayer request? No, I have a question. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, uh, I'll go back again to the resource, to the resource uh, aspect of it. When one person is always the source of prayer, when everybody has to turn to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray. Isn't is that, a, is, there's other people who have also need that could be um, neglected because we have to turn to the same person. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good that's a good one. <laughs> Where so oh, what I think about that is, is gotta pray. The demon came again, we gotta pray. They go, they do, they, they choose, they do worse. The demon come again, we gotta pray. All of that is is a spiritual resource that is not you know available to others that are trying hard to do the right thing. <laughs> but in that case, um, we're looking at the aspect of growth as well, mm -hmm. because um, the demons are not just always coming there to just all the time pound on you. What are you doing to attract those demons to come all the time as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just I'm, I'm still thinking I'm still having the perspective of the older brother because. <laughs> <laughs> 
is all beautiful. We we it, it now it's when it's when it's to my benefit. Oh, let's give grace. Let's give grace. Let's give grace. But when it's to others, no, we can't give grace. We can't. So what? Well, how are we managing all of that, especially in the setting of the church? How are we managing yeah. all of that? Yeah, I think I, I can answer for the uh, if you allow me. Yes, please. I think please. that what what God was. Um, uh, telling in the parable to the oldest brother because the grace uh, and the mercy is forever. You see, there's this uh, limitless amount of mercy that we have a hard time to capture because all grace or all grace is just sufficient for us. But the grace of God is. Ill, uh, illimited. The mercy of God is illimited. So when we take our, that aspect, like uh, in our human perspective, we will come to our limit, you understand. But the grace of God has no limit. And I'm, I'm talking, looking at the wealth of the Father. You see, for the other's brother, the wealth was uh, uh, waste on things that are not important. It was waste with uh, what was bad. But the father told the young man, the oldest that, you always have it all. But because the oldest was looking at his brother like he came to get also the love that I have already. You understand? The heart, the heart of the oldest one was not right. It was what the, the father tried to correct in this story. You see, we have to set our perspective knowing that God's mercy has no limit. So even though the person is bad, what God is, um, the joy of God is the child returning to him. God is not rejoicing because he went to do bad things. No, not at all. But he's rejoicing because the child returning to him. You see, in the house of Jacob, we always look at the house of Jacob. Sometimes I think that hey, we handle even our house better than Jacob. It was a mess. In the house of Jacob, you always have jealousy, prayer, you have all of this. But it was Jacob. In the house of Israel, I think that we, we will have better if we think by the spirit. But if we go by the flesh, there's too much happening. But it's the Spirit of God that allows us to pass all of this and to understand that we have more from the Father if we look at the Father. I don't know if I, I answer or I try to just to... Mm, I hope I answer. Amen. Amen. So Amen. Um, the, the question is about um, spending on resources. For example, mm -hmm. in a church environment where you can have like one person always coming in with like it's almost the same prayer request over mm -hmm. and over. For example, you do something, you come and they put in the mercy of God, everybody is laboring in the spirit for you, that you go back, do the same error, come back, go back, do the same yeah. error, come back. So yeah. how would you how do you address you you answer it? Yeah, you answer it by saying it's a question of growth. So the person need to have understanding. The person that you are ministering to need to understand first faith, need to understand uh, growth, maturity, and you need to put the person into her own responsibility. Like this is what you need to do by yourself. So it's a, a problem of communication. You understand? It's a problem of communication to tell the, we have people like that. When they were um, 
they were they they just came they want the world attention they want to have it all and everything but after you see that they put themselves in the same cycle because they didn't do this or that so it's a problem of communication you have to communicate that to the person that your faith has to grow this is the way it will be done you understand because you have to understand that people are born again but they have to mature they have to grow and it's not everybody growing i take the example like of euro for jesus Ruth herself started leadership. She was just born again. Mm -hmm. But she understood the, uh, the aspect of faith and she started tapping and growing on faith, growing on faith. But some of them who came after, they were all needy. What they want is, they want the problem to be solved. No, 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 no. Some came with problems that they were dragging for 30 years. But they want it answered. No, no, no. They didn't care about the rest, about evangelizing the world, Europe, and everything. They just want the problem to be solved. You understand? Even though she prayed, she prayed, do this, do this, do this. People lost patience. They even go move to another group because they think that the question are not answered. All of this is what? The problem of unbelief is a problem of growth, it's a problem of maturity. You see? And when you have many people who love it coming, you will never know. It's only the Spirit of God who knows the heart of each one. You will never know who will pass the class first, who will understand faith, or who will repeat, keep repeating, keep repeating, keep repeating the class. But it's not up to you because you have, as a leader, you just need to give grace. Mm -hmm. you understand mm -hmm. you just need to I don't know if you can have another solution because if you bring an intellectual solution you, it will never work mm -hmm. you yourself you lose patience mm -hmm. it's only the spirit of God who can solve that problem sometimes you don't know how many times I will wake up my heart so heavy by behavior of, of people. I say, okay, let me just close everything. I have a family, a husband who loves me. Why do I care? I have to go and move to something else. You understand? But it's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about the way we are feeling. It's about God. And we are just manager. Never forget. You talk about entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. Never forget that you are just a servant. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, dealing with human beings, you lost your patience. If the grace of God is not there, you will mm -hmm. lose your patience because yeah. we ourselves, we are so stubborn, even when we feel in touch that oh, everybody has to do things in a certain way. We also lose the patience as well. Exactly. Yeah. Amen. Um, Minister Lovett, um, I, I want to comment on the, the the big brother that was left at home who had such a meltdown when his little brother came home. Um, Mom said something that actually triggered my thought to think one of the problems that he could have had is that he was not secure enough in the love that the father had for him. Yeah, that's a good one. He... He was operating under the impression that now that there's more of us to love, the love that I receive is going to be less. So he throws a tantrum. And and which I think, means, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. And I think in the church, we, we tend to behave like that. I mean, I've shared before how um, I used to get jealous when other people talk about God, because to me, he was my father and my father only. I didn't want to share him. And that came out of immaturity. It came out of complete and total immaturity because I was still a baby in my faith. I didn't understand that God, the way he loves me passionately is the way he loves the next person passionately. If he can move heaven and earth for me, he can move heaven and earth for the next person. Yeah. Whether 
I think they're amazing or not. Because Amen. it's not me, it's about his love for us. So I think the brother had that insecurity to say, okay. you're now going to half the love that you have for me and give it to this person. Forgetting what Reb said, that his love and his mercy is endless. It's limitless. That's the, that's the first comment. On the second comment, um, I'm so happy Rev brought up the Europe for Jesus story because we had a case where this person would go and come back and go and come back and go and come back. And then at one point they just disappeared and we couldn't reach this person. And every night, those days we used to meet five nights a week. Every night we would pray for this person we would pray and cry to heaven for this person until the one night when the prayer point came up, I said, no, we are not going to pray for this person tonight. And everybody was like, ha, ah, how can you say that? That is so terrible. Why are you tired of praying? You're not supposed to get tired. I said, I'm not tired of praying. But one thing I know is that my God hears and he answers. The fact that he has not answered us means we are praying wrong. So let's stop praying for this person and let's ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to do. And that's what we did. We asked the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how do we resolve the situation? Because we've done all we know to do. We've prayed the scripture. We've prayed this person or we've prayed this person over with scripture. We have called this person in the spirit. This person is not responding. And we were really worried because we thought she was actually going to hurt herself. So we asked him, we said, what do we do? We need a new strategy. And you know what he told us? He said, ignore her. Ignore her. When she calls crying, don't answer. Huh. And we were like, what? What if she hurts her? He said, ignore her. It took four days she came back. On her own. Nobody was taking her calls. Nobody, because she would phone you and she'd be crying on the phone. And then please pray for me, please pray for me. When you ask her to pray, she says, I can't pray. Uh -huh. My mouth is closed. But she's crying incontrollably on the phone and your heart breaks for this person. But I said to them, I said, you know what? We're no longer going to be playing with her demons because that is what we that is demonic. And those demons are taking us for a ride. So we are going to ignore her. And then when she comes back, we'll do deliverance. And that's what we did. She came back. So the Lord is faithful. <laughs> His Amen. love is truly limitless and endless. <laughs> and we can go and come back as many times as we want until he, his mercy runs out one day, if ever it will. If ever it will. If ever it will. So that's just my contribution to these yeah. prodigal children. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So much as you're speaking, things are coming to my mouth. So I mean to my mind. So I wanted to <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um I wanted to say about the father when you said that um he did not the older brother did not feel the love of the father um enough. So he was threatened then the love is not gonna be that's a little bit what I mean by the spiritual resources. Because when, when the person stands and do not understand the way um, things operate, we all are learning about the Father every single day. We don't know anything. I don't know anything. I don't know about you, but I don't know anything. I wake up every day, marvel at his, at his glory. So I don't take anything for granted. I don't, I don't think that I'm all this or I'm all that. Because thinking that I'm, I'm not old, anything keeps me into perspective. And I always go to him to say, what is it? What do I do? Um, what I'm thinking, is it correct? What I'm, um, I'm, I'm feeling, is it correct? What I, because to me, this is a way because I don't know. I can be think, sitting here thinking one thing about a situation or about someone's behavior or, or, or reaction, but it's totally wrong. 
It's totally wrong. So the, the older brother was having a reaction that he thought that, okay, what's going on here? This one went and went and did this, that, and the other. How come he's coming and there's no accountability? He's, he's being received like this. I'm here working every day. His father had to come and explain to him his father has so he has there's an understanding that was missing. There's an understanding of the ways of his father he did not know. There's an understanding of the dynamic of the love of a father he didn't know. What he knew is that someone, what he knew that he was taught is that someone who does something wrong needs to be corrected. This is where it's coming from. So Seeing that the father was supposed to let the son come inside, sit him down and ask him, okay, I did you come back for good? Where did you go? Okay, don't <laughs> do it <this> again. <laughs> don't do this again. We worried about you. Your brother was worried about you. Everybody was worried about you. Don't do this again. Bring the food, feed him. This is what he was expecting because he did not know that aspect that the father he didn't know he was not taught you see so the father had to come and explain to him so what i'm saying is the the ways of god that we don't know is what either um if we want to know it's going to help us to understand and and appreciate things better otherwise you know, a lot of things could have gone array. A lot of things could have been, a lot of things are being misunderstood right now, right now in the church. People having reaction, things are being going on. My behavior is, is not, is it what the father wants? The way I feel? So I always ask him, am I, am I wrong to feel this is the way I feel about this? What is it? Is it wrong for me to feel this way? Are you the one teaching me this? Is it right what I'm doing? Is that what you want me to do? So when I go through this process, it helps me understand what he's doing or what I'm not supposed to do or what I did wrong or all of that stuff. And otherwise, I don't know. I will have the human understanding reaction. You see what I mean? So mm -hmm. the fact come to the older brother to explain to him. So knowledge of the ways of God is what help us give grace. Like in your, in your, in your, um, in, in your case, in Europe for Jesus, you have to ask him and he said, ignore her. Ignoring her, you be like, you even said, what? Because the father is the father. He loves everybody unconditionally. But the, in this case, they ignore her. Is that a lack of grace? So Abba Father does not have grace anymore? No. So we have to know what is going on in a situation and what is going on because we cannot give we cannot give one thing to one situation because it's advantageous to us. And then we give something to another situation because that is we don't you know we don't like the thing or the situation is not advantageous to us or we don't like the person so everything we have to do has to be from the information and the knowledge that the lord gives to us so that's what i wanted to add he has the older brother has to be taught yes i train you your whole life to be a accountable for your wrongdoing. I taught you your whole life that the wages of sin is death. I taught you your whole life that you have to be punished when you do something. There are consequences that you, that of every action. I taught you your whole life. Even him, I taught him too. The two of you, I taught you. But there is something more for you to learn in this situation. Because he was, he was reacting based on what he knew before, that his father taught him. Amen. Amen. We actually had a situation like that in a family where 
one of my uncles had just gone and he stayed for so many years and he never came back. So when he showed up, the whole family was so happy that he came. But he has his own brother, the only two brothers. So his other brother, the day they were going to celebrate him, his other brother went to the field. <laughs> he didn't even want to come back from that field. He's like, yes, come back and so what? <laughs> and so when the whole family was sitting down, his brother was not back from the field. It was all dark and late at night. That's when his brother showed up and the family really frowned at his behavior. But he was like, no, he stayed out for more than 20 years. He never showed up. What do I do? Do I have to stay home and not do, look for, fend for myself and my family? I take care of myself. And so this is how um, the dynamic of human understanding and how we can react in different ways when it comes to this situation. But um, in here, I think that God is showing his mercy. He's showing his compassion. And he just wants us to emulate, especially if there's actually a real turnaround. Because we are aware of what he went through, the pain he went through. Now he's coming back now, not feeling entitled to everything as he had before. His perspective is different and he's coming out with humility. And he even wants to be at the level of a servant, to be paid like a servant, not even like a son anymore. And so that's where we also want to see his repentance also. Because the difficulty we have is if someone is coming back and they're not totally um, repentant and they still go around doing the same thing. And that's why in the situation of Europe for Jesus, the Lord is like, ignore her because she will come back and do the same thing and it's, it's like being manipulative but if you're coming back genuinely and you mean it and you're like father have mercy here am I the Lord will show mercy and that's why I say if you seek me with all your heart I'll be found near you it means I've, I've never been far away I've been here with you but it's that I haven't seen you coming with all your heart. You keep coming and going and coming and going. It's not the same. That's why you keep jumping here and there. But when you're ready for me, I'm right here waiting for you. Amen. Okay. Is there any prayer request? Okay, so if we do not have any prayer requests, um, I just want us all to pray for, uh, we, let us keep on praying for our ministry as a whole. And for summertime, the safety of the children around the world and in our mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. Okay, amen. Okay. And also, sorry, I love it. Um, the, there's a conflict that could brew in Kenya. We need to pray for Kenya. Hmm. Okay. All right. Any other prayer requests? Talking about um, countries, let's continue praying for Mali. Uh, even the three tri countries, um, Mali, Guinea, and Burkina, who are fighting. Um, the economic independence and they are getting sent food into food by their own African brothers. We pray that the Lord come through to them and the Lord, you know, be the defender and they, they can break free from all this international pressure. Yeah. Really want Mali to succeed. Amen. 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 Okay, let's, let us all pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, our King, Daddy, we thank you for everything. Father, your word says that before we ask, you have already answered. And while we are asking, oh God, you are answering because you've heard the cry of our hearts, oh Lord. Father, before you, we continue to pray for a new beginning. We pray, oh Lord, for multiplication, advancement, and we pray for spiritual growth. For every individual that comes in. And so, Father, we pray as well for Mali, Kina Faso, 
Kenya, Cameroon, all of these countries going through um, uh, political crisis and everything, <laughs> economic crisis, and fighting for independence. Father, we pray for establishment that your grace and your mercy, O oh God, will manifest in these nations in the name of Jesus. That at the end of it, all glory, honor, and adoration will be given unto you. Father, we honor you, O oh God, for your grace and for your mercy, your compassion, your endless love, your mercy upon our lives. Father, we do not deserve it, but Lord, you've always chosen us and you've always loved us and you've always been there for us when we're not even there for our own selves. Father, we do not take any of your grace that you pour upon us for granted. But we bless you, O oh God, for everything that you're doing. And so, Father, we come yeah. before you and we repent where we have wronged you, knowingly and unknowingly, where we've acted out of the flesh, where we've acted out of entitlement. Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will help us and see us through. We want to pray for the rest of the watches that are coming up, O oh God. We pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to manifest. And we pray for everyone that will be able to attend their watches. They will not go back the same, that they will be refilled and refreshed. We pray for everyone that was able to join this watch, praying for Reverend Paulette, Brett D, um, Europe for Jesus, Vera. We pray that, Lord, your word will continue to abide and dwell in our hearts and continue to direct us in every step and other our steps. At the end of it, all glory, honor, and adoration. We pray for extreme and exceeding love that you have always poured upon us and that we experience your great compassion. Let your name be glorified in all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you everyone for joining and see you in the next watch. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank Be you. Blessed. Be blessed. Bye. Bye-bye.